Good morning, everybody. It's another wonderful day at COP27. <laughs> I'm sure we're all racing to the highest ambition possible before the, the COP27 is closing. And I'm really pleased to welcome you today to, to this side event, which is very topical. I have to say, um, we face a little bit of challenge because at the exact same time, you have the informal consultations on Cornivia happening, which are really related to today's side event. Um, but I'm grateful that uh, you, you can make time uh, because now it's up to a smaller group of negotiators since it's under the lead of the COP27 presidency to, to close the text. It's a long text and I encourage you all to look at it. Anyway, so um, we, we're really pleased about the side event because the, the, the title, as you can see, is Unlocking Multi-Stakeholder Collaboration for Transformative Agri-Food Systems through NDC and NAPS. And um, since we already talk about multi-stakeholder, we also thought let's do an event together with really key partners. So this event is actually organized together um, by, by FAO, UNDP, WWF, Climate Focus, JV, and GAF. I'm not spelling that out, but I'm sure you all know that. And um, we have some distinguished um, um, panelists and uh, Julie Tang. Um, will uh, say some introductory words. She's the global lead on a SCALA program, which is called Scaling Up Climate Ambition on Agriculture and Land Use through NDC and NAPS. So I'm looking forward to, to her welcoming remarks. Um, we are still missing um, a speaker from Senegal, so um, he will probably join later. Other than that, um, after some input uh, presentations, I would really welcome, welcome you warmly to have a discussion together on where you think, uh, what has been your reading so far in COP27, and where you would like the, the agriculture and land use climate uh, agenda be going forward in terms of implementation. Um, this event is also um, streamed live, uh, like virtually, so we also have some participants online. So you can also en engage with them in some way. Um, it is uh, really the focus of the event is to just look at things in a more nexus way in, a, in, in terms of um, a holistic approach, looking at the, the key uh, multi-stakeholder engagement, which often falls short for many reasons. So we also want to know your views in terms of where you see the key barriers. And um, yeah, so let's uh, get it started, I guess. Um, so I really warmly welcome uh, Julie Tang from UNDP to give some in opening remarks. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, so this is uh, my pleasure to also welcome you to this event. I'm Julie Tang. I'm a te technical specialist on NAP at UNDP, um, Adaptation Planning. And I have the pleasure, as Julia said, to co-lead the Global Scala program with Julia from FAO. Um, so thank you very much for joining our event. Um, this is a really important COP, as you've heard over the last uh, week. It's a COP for implementation. And we at UNDP and FAO believe that uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration and systems approaches are really key to achieve the transformation that we need. And before I go a bit further, I would like to thank the co-organizers, uh, FAO of course, WWF, GAF, Climate Focus, um, and this is already an example of um, working together between the UN and civil society organizations. So um, the IPCC report and all the later scientific reports and the emissions gap report that will be launched today by UNEP show that we're really off track to achieve the uh, target to limit uh, temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. And if we don't address agri-food systems, it is nearly impossible for us to reach those targets. And that's because they're really key for both mitigation and adaptation targets. On the mitigation front, uh, agriculture accounts for more than one third of the global emissions. And on the adaptation front, agriculture is the major sector of the economy and a major source of livelihoods for most of the population of developing countries. So by addressing agri-food systems, we um, can both achieve large-scale reduction in emissions and also significantly improve the resilience of populations. But for those agri-food systems to be sustainable, to contribute to global goals, the global climate goals, they need to be transformed. And that transformation is complex because agri-food systems are complex. They uh, involve different drivers, climate change, economic shocks, political instability. 
but they also have huge economic stakes and a lot of stakeholders because of those stakes. Um, and when you look at NDCs and NAPs of countries, they provide a useful framework for, and they present the commitments, they present the priority actions, but they don't really necessarily provide an integrated manner in which these need to be addressed. And that's what our Scala program is trying to address. It's trying to look at the way the different elements of the systems are interacting and the way we can really develop an approach that can achieve transformation and can really have a um, impact at scale. And one of the um, main part of this uh, equation is really the actors that are part of the system. It's the actors that influence the system, that shape the dynamics within those systems. And there is a really strong need to look at effective collaboration between the different stakeholders. And those, for us, um, need a threefold intervention. The first one is that we need to go look at innovative approaches that go beyond coordination. And that is really required to have inclusive participation and to really have a meaningful dialogue among actors that have diverging views. The uh, second part, which is linked, is that there needs to be capacity building for a new type of leadership. There needs to be systems leadership or whatever we want to call it, but that really foster uh, an approach and um, for decision makers to convene different actors, to really come, uh, come up with a common agenda, to co-design solutions so that we can really have um, an integrated approach to addressing those, uh, those uh, systemic level uh, issues. And the third point is that it's really key as well to address the needs and the priorities of the groups that are at the margin of decision making because first um, they need to be addressed and they need to have ownership of those decisions but also because their knowledge and their perspective can really enrich the solutions that we come up with. And to conclude, I would say that this is really what Scala is trying to achieve. We're looking at how to address the barriers for multi stakeholder collaboration. We're looking at how to promote inclusive and whole of society approaches. And we're also looking at how to engage the private sector more so that we can le leverage funding and have investment at scale. Um, and to, before I pass the floor to others, I want to say that Scala is really a program that wants to focus on learning, on exchange, on knowledge production that we can disseminate. And I'm really excited to have different speakers here from different organizations, different countries, share their experience and um, to learn from them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Julie. And uh, thanks again um, for, for really clearly outlining the, the kind of programmatic approach for, of Scala in terms of looking at innovation, leadership, and also the inclusiveness. And I have to say, it's, it's quite interesting that the, the Cornevia uh, text also points very much for the first time on this inclusiveness of local actors, of women, of indigenous peoples. No? So there's an understanding, and, and you explain really well how um, the Scala program through the UNDP and FAR support tries to pick that, pick that up in terms of really making um, vulnerable groups or like people who need to be in the food system the dialogue part of the discussion. No, it's kind of an empowerment approach is really key because if the decision making is not with them, it, it's really difficult to reach the impact we all want to achieve. And by the way, today um, we have a celebration. <laughs> I, I read this morning, don't cite me if it's wrong, but I, I find it an interesting fact. Today is the eighth billion person born. So today it's a very um, proper day to think about food systems and food security as such because um, with it, and that's kind of what the, the communication tries to, hear, uh, to do here at COP27, we can forget about the 1.2 degree target if we don't look at agriculture and land use um, to make it part of the climate solution. No? And that deals with the question on how do we feed uh, the world and, and the world population, a growing world population, in a low carbon and climate resilient way. So um, thanks so much. Um, now we'll, we'll um, um, move to the next speaker, who is uh, Patty Fong. She's the program director for Climate Health Global Alliance for the Future of Food. And I'm very curious to, to listen to your input speech, um, because you'd probably bring in the health dimension I haven't mentioned so far. 
this. Uh, you want to stand here? Thank you, Julia. Um, so you've probably heard the statistic go around for the last week and a half, if you've been here, that food systems only receives 3% of climate finance um, currently, even though it contributes to 33, so one third, one third of all global greenhouse gas emissions. This is the analysis that um, we put out a couple of weeks ago. This amount, 3%, is 22 times less than the amount that is currently going to clean energy and transport. So this means that even if all other emissions were stopped tomorrow, we would still overshoot our 1.5 degree goal in the Paris Agreement due to, to global food related emissions. But we know we have the solutions and you know, conservative estimates um, have, have shown that food systems measures can easily reduce 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So why is there this discrepancy? I'll give you three reasons. One is public finance right now is not aligned with our global climate and health goals. The second reason is food systems is not prioritized in the climate action plans, neither the NDCs nor the, nor the NAPs. And third, food system stakeholders are not engaged in the process in the by the climate community, by climate-focused uh, policymakers. So first to the, the first reason. So most public money going to agriculture production right now, so over 600 billion a year, 86% of that, so 520 billion, is not aligned, is potentially harmful to climate, environmental, and health goals. This means that this money is potentially going to, without any safeguards on agrochemicals like pesticides and fertilizers and on synthetic, uh, synthetic fertilizers. Um, so for example, you heard perhaps that on Friday there was an announcement of the uh, Global Fertilizer Challenge. And a lot of that is actually going to increased fertilizer use by subsistence farmers in developing countries. So we're actually headed in the wrong direction with government funding. And moreover, the funding that is going out there is actually going to emissions intensive and unhealthy commodities. So meanwhile, fiscal support for fruits and vegetables received very little money. So what this is doing is incentivizing the production of of um, these types of commodities and disincentivizing the production of, of more nutritious and culturally appropriate foods. And the amount of public finance currently is 50, towards these harmful, potentially harmful um, products, commodities, is 57 times greater than the amount of climate finance that is going to food systems. And we know that, so compare the number, 520 billion that is potentially harmful. Analysis by the Food and Land Use Coalition estimates that investment going to more resilient and sustainable food systems is very cost effective, 350 billion. So we know that there is money, but it needs to be directed in the right, in the right way. So this gets to my second reason, that food systems measures is not a priority. So we looked at the NDCs of 14 countries and actually just, I think, Last week, two weeks ago, WF with Comet Focus also did a more comprehensive look at all the 167 NDCs. And there has been some improvement um, in some aspects of food systems. So for example, more NDCs are going towards sustainable aquaculture, agroecology, agroforestry, to a much smaller extent uh, around post-harvest measures, food loss and waste, dietary shifts. But by and large, a holistic approach to food systems is missing from pretty much all NDCs. So out of the 167 that were looked at, just two, just two took a holistic approach of looking at sustainable production, food loss and waste, and sustainable and healthy diets. And of the NDCs that did mention food systems, and among those of, that were developing countries, those countries just asked for just 14 billion in food systems while they asked for 64 billion for clean energy and transport. So why is this? Why, why is this not a priority? Well, the main reason is food system stakeholders have not been to date engaged in the, the, the design, development, and implementation of the NDCs. So 
if you are not consulting with the people who are most impacted, who have the solutions, you're not going to get those answers and integrate it into the climate plan. So um, Julie talked about how you know, Scala program is trying to do this, and we really make, need to make sure that food system stakeholders are part of the climate process, really engaging with climate policy makers. So we find that you know, food system stakeholders are not just limited to, let's say, um, advocates, CSOs. We, found, we looked at, we interviewed stakeholders in 14 countries around the world to really understand what is the process for developing the NDCs and the implementation. And we looked at stakeholders who are coming from government, private sector, health sector, civil society, as well as food systems experts, other food systems experts. And we found that, one, coordination across governments. Few processes actually meaningfully engage across different ministries with regional governments or with local public officials. There is very limited engagement with non-governmental stakeholders, including the private sector, smallholder farmers, women, local communities, indigenous peoples, and civil society. And experts from the health and nutrition sector were also not consulted, even though all countries face nutritional and health-related challenges linked to food, whether it's obesity and overweight, or under, under nutrition and food security. So our call to action is that countries need to take this issue more seriously and they need to update their climate action plans to include food systems and really prioritize it. Of course, richer countries need to step up with their financial support, but developing countries need to prioritize it in order to access the climate finance that is available. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patty. And I really loved your clear structure and your, and your three points being uh, the key barriers you identified in terms of public finance alignment, um, the, the need for uh, increased climate finance going into food systems financing. So thanks for providing this um, numbers. That's always good to know what is actually the reality. And the third point in terms of the lack of inclusiveness. FAO ha also has done um, a lot of the, the NDC analysis, let's say, on the agriculture sector since 2015. And, and our reading is, is similar, um, even though one has to say that the food systems terminology hasn't been around enough, I guess, and hasn't been dialogued enough. I mean, it started a lot with the UN system, Systems Dialogue that had really like national and subnational dialogues. But I guess we will see a change in the next, in the 2025 NDC generations. So I, um, I think that it's really important to use that time. No? Now we have 2022 to use, use the remaining time to actually redefine a little bit, saying, okay, in the NDC consultation. So I, I li really liked your invitation on, on really having more comprehensive NDC sector consultations, no? because the agriculture sector, for example, has been really involved. No? I mean, it's 95 of the developing countries say agriculture and adaptation has to be a key priority. You know? Now, we need to do the next step in terms of more inclusiveness approach and consult um, with health and, and um, other sectors, nutrition, etc., which are not necessarily sitting in the same uh, department. So it's an all of government approach in some way that needs to, to happen. Um, so we will turn now to some country perspectives, and, and I'm really thankful for Mr. Professor Abu Barfal, if I pronounce that rightly, to come. Um, oh no, that's not you. Is Mr. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was announced that he's coming, but um, apologies. Okay, well, anyway, welcome you anyway, Senna. Um, but I have, I have first Irene to speak. So she's the Senior Climate Change Officer, Mitigation Ministry of Water and Environment of Uganda. Um, and I'm really pleased to, to hear your perspective on uh, what we're talking here and where you see the way forward for increased um, in implementation efforts um, on NDC and NAPS for agri-food systems, the agriculture sector. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, she already introduced myself, and uh, I'll just go straight to uh, putting up some few points. 
And I just want to give you some uh, bit of uh, an overview of the agriculture sector uh, in Uganda. So the, while we were um, doing our NDC update, we did uh, what is called a vulnerability risk assessment for a number of sectors. But um, it turned out that um, the agriculture sector is still most uh, vulnerable, but also at risk to climate um, change. But the beauty about it is that um, uh, our um, agriculture sector, uh, in terms of readiness, is doing quite well. Uh, they have put up um, the medium and the long-term plans to address the impact of climate change in the sector. In the medium term, um, we have come up with the, what is called the NAPS, the National Adaptation Plan, as a sector. Actually, it's a very fast sector to come up with that. As a country, we are just having a roadmap for you know the national roadmap, but the agriculture sector alone has come up with the, the NAP of its own. So we think that is really a very good step ahead. Uh, and of course, we'd like to thank uh, our partners, the FAO and UNDP for that. And also in the long term, the uh, plans in place uh, that the sector has come up with, and that is, um, in the uh, long-term low emission development strategy. As a country, we have a national one, which is still a draft, but also the agriculture sector has moved a step ahead to come up with its own long-term plan. And so we think that is really a very good um, uh, uh, preparation in terms of uh, you know, putting in place um, the strategy on how to implement uh, or address the vulnerability of the sector. And um, of course, the long-term development strategy for the agriculture sector, uh, we really want to thank our partners, uh, Agnes and Ilyri and FAO as well. And um, in our updated agri NDC, the agriculture sector actually features more predominantly with both adaptation and mitigation, um, and including elaboration of its subsectors, that is agriculture, I mean the crop, the animal, and the fisheries. And in aggregate terms, um, we, um, we see the agriculture sector, which is part of our follow or agriculture, forestry, and land use areas, to be one of those um, um, sectors which is, which is having a very high potential in terms of um, um, em emit, uh, reducing our emissions as a country. In fact, the uh, follow alone sector, we have estimated it to um, reduce about 24% of the total sector emissions. And so this is really uh, having a very high mitigation potential. Um, in terms of, um, that is just um, an overview, but in terms of uh, you know um, the strategy that the country has come up with on how to implement our NDC, we think that the whole of government, the whole of society approach is the best approach for us if we have to achieve or attain the objective of the the NDC or the actions that we've put in place in our NDC. Uh, so government will continue to employ the whole of government engagement and whole of society approach to implement our NDC. And the whole of government will build on the existing um, um, tripartite arrangements which is in place. That is uh, the Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development together with the National Planning Authority and the Minister of Water and Environment. So these three uh, do the plans and then also solicit for financing to do implementation of the climate actions that we've set up in our NDC. And, um, um, uh, and so uh, other lead agencies, of course, such as the Office of the Prime Minister, we think that we need to strengthen the role of uh, this ministry to synchronize the, pro the progress of climate action with the progress on SDGs. But with the new climate law now, which uh, the country has in place, uh, all local government climate actions uh, will be guided and reported by the district natural resources officers. That is the structure which is at the district local government and um, will be assisted by the district environment and natural resources committee that is already in place. And so the whole of society approach actually will be anchored in the multi-stakeholder national climate change advisory committee that is 
in place and is charged with the responsibility of um, the provision of independent technical advice to the policy committee and the Minister of Environment. And so the, this NAC or the committee which is in place has the representation of academia, uh, private sector, um, and civil society as well as government uh, ministries, departments and agencies. And so the whole of society approach will be complemented uh, by actions done by the women, the youth, uh, private sector, NGOs, uh, among others, in collaborating with the climate change department, which is responsible for coordinating the climate change um, actions in the country. I'd like to thank you and be here. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a lot of work uh, that, you and, uh, that you, Uganda has been doing. Um, thanks for bringing in the long-term strategies. It's really a, a very key instrument where climate information can inform the future. No, it's not like a plan for implementation, but it's really informing the future of the sector um, on, and the agri-food systems as such. So thanks so much. And, and also compliments for, for you, Uganda um, accomplishing the, the updated the revised um, NDC. That's also a, a key milestone that gives a signal to conferences as such. No, I mean, imagine if... Um, I remember in the plenary in the beginning, they actually said only 20 countries had been submitting their, their, their revised NDCs. No? So that gives a signal to the international community that it is actually a very useful instrument of communicating where countries are and what they aim to, to look for no? in terms of implementation. Thanks so much. Um, um, yes, great. So let's um, hear from the, the next speaker, Bridget. Um, uh, let me just introduce you properly. So, uh, Brigitte Mugabe, she's a program coordinator um, of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, um, AFSA, if you know the abbreviation. And um, I would like to ask you a question on uh, participation, because, I mean, while we all agree participation is needed and inclusiveness, it is still often not happening. Where do you see the key barriers um, in terms of what, what would be your advice in terms of really stepping up in the next phase to come, which is on implementation to, to reach this, this uh, sufficient level of inclusiveness? Um, thank you so much uh, for the question. I think I would just um, also speak a bit to what uh, Irene has shared uh, because I also come from Uganda. So um, yes, I know there was a process to develop the NDC and uh, like she has shared, it took quite a bit of time. And also appreciate that um, there is a civil society included as part of the, the coordinating committee. I think uh, in terms of participation, one, as a continental network organization, we do uh, have membership in different African countries, so we get a feel of how different uh, countries relate with the marginalized groups, with farmers, with uh, fisher folk, and um, a number of other actors. And I think, uh, for me, why, why we are not yet getting uh, adequate participation, there are a number of reasons. One. Um, the spaces provided for participation by the governments are still very limited. Uh, you will find uh, maybe one civil society organization sitting in a panel with so many uh, government entities, and this civil society organization could be an environment organization, could be an agriculture organization. They don't have the capacity to do all the consultation. So uh, you end up being participated, but not participating. So there has to be the government space and willingness to have in, um, in the right positions the different representatives. For me, I would rather have a room of, uh, of a committee as long as you have the right people in the right space. Uh, also the fact that many consultations do not go down to the grassroots. And uh, I have to, not because I come from civil society, but uh, in all true civil society is doing a lot of work doing consultations at the national level and the grassroots level and trying to get the spaces to get this information to the government. But it is a government role and that has to be um, a read in place. Uh, the other issue probably, the other barrier that I could talk about uh, is the issue of resources. I think we have to appreciate that. Resources are allocated uh, for a specific process. 
For example, the NDC uh, process in Uganda was supported by UNDPA and FAO and maybe some others. So the resources are limited to what uh, they can support and we don't have a clear public budget to do the, you know, the necessary uh, consultation. And this, I, I could say, happens in many um, uh, African countries. Um, so wh when we look at, uh, I, I think also to, to not to just talk about the barriers, if I could just uh, speak to one, one, one uh, recommendation, how we can you know, deal with some of this one. Uh, like I've mentioned, we need the spaces uh, to, to, uh, to get that in place. We need uh, deliberate uh, government effort and uh, budgets allocated to consultation of marginalized groups. We need also to get the marginalized groups in such spaces because this is where we get to meet, uh, you know, the key people, the negotiators, the government people that we can't meet at home. So we are able to, to, uh, to share some of that uh, yeah, relevant information. Points, excellent points. Thank you so much. Um, it is uh, it is challenging, as you say, to, to have the right person in the right place, and um, it also requires a, a lot of more attention to capacity building. No, no. Some of them ha have been in that space and talking maybe in public for for many years, but to really uplift the stakeholder, it needs um, more support than just inviting them to meeting. It actually needs maybe some coaching or preparation. Um, there may be language barriers as well, as you, as you mentioned. No? So thanks so much for, for, for making those very um, important points and pointing so, to some recommendations. Let me now invite you, before we open the, the group discussion, let's say, um, Sina, and apologies again that I <laughs> uh, took you for another person. So we have Sina Aluka. He's an executive di director of the Jeunes Volontaires pour l'Environnement, so the Young Volunteers for Environment International. <laughs> and I'm really pleased to, to have you here. And um, yeah, over to you. Um, my specific question for you is like, what would you share in terms of some lessons learned from the work you've been doing and some key recommendations on on uh, to, to to us to to the COP audience, let's say, who who is engaged not only at the policy advocacy level but also at the programmatic level. No, it's it's often like the the inclusiveness can be planned into programming, right? So, what is what is your recommendation to to do a better job? Thank you very much. <coughs> Bonjour, comment ça va? Okay, at least some a few French uh, to start with. Yeah, so. Uh, you know which is the day? Today is ACE Day. How many people know about ACE? Action for Climate Empowerment. Article 12 of the Paris Agreement. It used to be Article 6 before. That talks about participation, inclusion, you know, uh, capacity building, education, training. Today we are talking about participation, youth inclusion, and uh, all the rest. Participation, like Bridget just mentioned. And this is driven mostly by. Uh, the education uh, constituency is a new one, and also with support from the Yungu. And thank you very much for this question. I, I would like to start with what we'll be doing and uh, where we are today, the need to increase this approach of involving more stakeholders, particularly the young people. Uh, that's what we'll be doing. I'm very happy. Uh, I started when I was very young. That's why our NGO is called Young Volunteers. We are going to change the name very soon to Old Volunteers. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm a founding member of Yungu. I was there at Koi One, 2003, you know, when it all started. I'm happy about what I can see today and see more spaces, even the Yungu have their own pavilion. And uh, forging more participation of all stakeholders in the development of NAPS, in the development of the, our NDCs. So, uh, best lesson we learn is that we have a lot to gain by ensuring we factor in the participation of all stakeholders, particularly the young people and the women, in the uh, definition of all policies. Uh, in some countries like Tanzania that I follow, Zimbabwe, Togo, Benin, most Francophone countries, some of the NDCs have to be done at the second time because there was lack of participation in the early phase. So it's good that we start very early in the continuation of this because, you know, uh, we are going to continue meeting in UAE next year. I hope to see you guys at COP99 somewhere. So policies will be developed again and again. How do we make sure that 
we make a lot of gains, benefit by including all stakeholders in the, at a very early age. That's what is being done at the NDC partnership, for instance. They are supporting countries in the update of their NDCs to involve women and young people, and there is funding for that. The second one is about supporting uh, yeah, uh, youth and women-driven projects. Very important, because for now, some of the, our people in the villages, they keep asking, Bridget, why are you going to the COP? We see nothing. But uh, uh, people, it's hard for them to see that decisions taken at the COP impact directly on their livelihood. We are implementing a project in Togo that is part of the Adaptation Fund. So Adaptation Fund gives some support, financial resource, to uh, WMO. WMO supported Global Water Partnership, and we benefit from it. And that decision was taken uh, somewhere in the COP decisions. So we need to support projects uh, that can have direct impact on the lives of people. Very, very important. And also work with local governance, local government, municipalities. Very important. And that's what uh, AFSA is doing, the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, supporting agroecology transitions in some territories, in some municipalities. In the context of Togo, for instance, we are translating all these policies, all the documents, into a project where we are supporting nine municipalities, four districts, and about, that's about two million people, 600,000 farmers, to uh, do something similar to what happened in Andhra Pradesh, in India, where you have two million farmers going agroecology. We are copying, updating, well, togolizing, and using the same approach in Togo. So next time you come to Togo, we bring you to the Grand Koloto area, where you see about 600,000 farmers practicing agroecology. And actually, we keep saying agroecology is not something of the past, it's something of the future. It incorporates innovation, incorporates even caterpillars, science, the drone, everything can be in the agroecology, you know? So uh, that's what we will be promoting. And the, the, the last one is about providing space. So uh, uh, at, at AFSA, uh, what we'll be trying to do now is creating platform for young people. So we have the uh, youth group uh, that's, you know, trying to help to understand. And I'm running just a few minutes here. I'm going to the Togo Pavilion. We'll be launching today a new climate crisis education manual for young people at school at very early age up to university. So these are some of the things we have learned, education, training, we are talking about transitioning, but what are the skills? We don't have the skill. That's it teaching my people in Togo, World War, World War, World, first, one, first World War, right? We'll be talking about Second World War. We'll be learning about uh, countries I know more can take it than my own country. You know, and you have more people learning about literature, poetry, than the, the skills that's needed for the transition that we call it here. So the skills development, I think, is something very important. That's why please join us today for the is celebration and if you miss everything come to hotel lamborghini at seven o'clock there's good food for there with celebration education and participation for young people merci beaucoup merci beaucoup aussi pour toi um i i'm really impressed about uh, your point and and how you show um how in togo you, you have leadership in terms of looking at the curricula it's a generational challenge as you say right it's like what skill sets are needed for this transition? I, I think that's an excellent point, and there are so many ways to do it. But um, I think it's, it's also great that you, you highlight the um, ACE work, which is uh, a very important uh, stream in, in the UNFC, which uh, lots of negotiators fought for for many years. And now it's expanding, um, and it's very lively. So um, FAO is also following that um, to, to some extent. So thanks for making that point. So now we have uh, some minutes um, left before we, we hear from uh, Joao Campari from the, the, for the closing. Um, who would like to contribute to some things you heard, um, your own perspective in terms of the challenges and the barriers when it comes to inclusiveness? Um, the, the floor is open. Who would like to join into some of the reflections? OK. Ah, yeah. Thank you so much, Federica. Do you just show uh, your hand, Federica? Here on the left, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Joshua Aizuka. I uh, come from Uganda. Uh, I work with Pelham Uganda, also uh, a partner of uh, and a member of AFSA. 
Uh, my thank you very much, panelists, for the very, uh, very insightful conversation. I think, uh, as it has been said, the whole conversation on food systems is still quite new. And for me, one of the issues that uh, get my attention is the, how would we put in place an enabling institutional mechanism for actually operationalizing a food systems approach. Uh, I, I was very happy to learn about the different uh, uh, institutional structures, at least in Uganda. Uh, but then how do we make them functional? How do we ensure there is that inclusivity? How do we localize some of these processes for decision making and provide platforms for people who are the key stakeholders in these food systems to actually influence the decisions that affect uh, uh, their way of life? So I think we, yeah, when, when we, we are done with the talking, the reality is uh, most, most times implementation is done in silos. So uh, the, the nexus for me to have uh, a holistic and inclusive food systems approach and seeing how we build resilience within the entire food system becomes, uh, still remains a gray area. And I think we need a lot of uh, uh, one awareness, capacity building, and also rethinking the systems that are in place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, you raised such an important point because there's a risk of fragmentation when it comes to maybe programmatic or project consultation, which are not linked to set up institutional processes that have some um, like longer term like uh, vision, not because otherwise it's like, yeah, well, we've done our inclusive approach, but then what's next? No? So it's not a punctual thing, actually, what we're talking about. It's really something that needs to be owned by the, by the institutions that are responsible for, for the, um, the agri-food sector, let's say. Um, we have an intervention here, please. Hi. Um, I, my name is Una Murray, and I'm from the University of Galway in Ireland. And thank you very much, um, Irene. I, I really enjoyed your talk about the whole of society approach to food systems. Um, and it was a really nice example from uh, Uganda of, of how you tried to do this. And I was just thinking, you know, it's easy to say, but very hard to do in practice. Um, and you seem to present a good example of that. But I was just wondering, how do you get around the different interests in food systems, particularly private sector who may want to promote, you know, products or whatever. So how do you engage the private sector and get them on board? And it's a broader question as well. Thank you. Just okay. to Uganda. Thank you so much. Um, we, we'll do, we only have time for one round of questions. So let's collect all, all the questions. Then each of you has uh, one slot to answer. And I will also invite uh, Julie and, and Patsy to, to take some, uh, say some take home message. And then we have the closing. So ev everybody who wants to say something, please, your time is now. Please, madam. Yeah, uh, uh, good morning. Thanks to the panelists. My name is Karen Nekesa. I work for a, an organization called uh, Regional Schools and Colleges Permaculture Program. And, and by its na the name, you can tell you work with very young children in, in both primary and secondary school. And uh, the issue has been, especially in the NDCs, the issue of coordination. There's so many policies at national levels that are uh, actually just uh, not harmonized, so people do not actually understand when and how to participate. The other issue when it comes to public participation is access to information. So at the local level, we have communities, those who want to really follow the discussions and really participate, that uh, do not access the information, whether from the local authorities or from the, the government. So I think that's an issue that we also need to understand how, for example, Uganda is doing it, uh, maybe probably from Irene. Then um, for me, the other issue, I like the way what uh, my brother Senna said about schools. And uh, we are working across uh, Eastern and Southern Africa with the young children just to establish what we are calling food forests. 
for contributing to issues of uh, reducing emission, but also uh, connect, connecting the school children to nature and culture. Therefore, also engaging them practically on issues of uh, climate action through dialogues. And the dialogues have been very helpful. We are even having children attending exchange visits, attending the other seeing what the others are doing and also participating in meetings. So it's very important to encourage that, but also just to learn and understand how the other policies at national levels are connect so that we, the community members especially don't get confused. Thank you. Thank you so much and compliments on my, my admiration for your work with the young children. I think that's the best investment um, you can do. Um, I also find your point in terms of access to information very key because we always talk about access to finance, but the first step before that is actually access to information. So thanks uh, for, for making that point. We had like two more, I think, please. Hello. Yes, good morning. Thank you all the panelists. I'm Aitor from Brazil. I work at Conservation and Climate Finance Analyst in Citawi Finance for Google and ONG. And in Brazil ecosystems, we see a quite difficult to hold all the stakeholders because at some kind of way they still don't understand exactly what we are talking about with conservation and climate finance and of course that includes food system more resilient food system finance so i think that we are seeing that could be a, a short way is try to connect uh, hybrid finance taking on one side philanthropic funds philanthropic money and public money that could reduce the risk for getting in the private sector. So I'd like to ask, in your perspective, how is being this dialogue between, in one side, state and philanthropic fund, and the other side, the relation with the private sector? And working as a um, Brazil country representative for the Youth Professionals for Agricultural Development, would like to know how are you including the youth perspective? So how is the money, when this goes through, the, through all the way, how the youth are being interacting and taking actions and doing their point of views in all the, the, all the dialogue. So thank you very much. Great question. Great question. Okay, no, sorry. Um, do we have one more? Oh, that's it. No. I think great. So thanks so much. Youth is very important. We spoke about children, youth, so we have through the whole generation, so that's uh, wonderful. So now you have uh, each one, like, uh, um, please pick up on the questions that you, you felt um, was referring to you, and then we have uh, Patia and Julie. Before the closing, we have... Who wants to go first? Irene? Brigitte? Thank you very much uh, for the questions. I'll try to address some of them. Hopefully, I'll address all of them. Let me start with the very last one, uh, which is to do with the, the dialogue um, between governments and how we engage with the civil society and the youth uh, in implementing the, uh, the actions that are highlighted in the NDC. Uh, is this one okay? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, I need to be short. Okay. Um, so how we do uh, plan to engage with the, these other groups, um, the youth, the civil society. Uh, first of all, we already engaged them. From the time we did the, uh, we drafting our updated NDC, we had a lot of consultations and we had specific consultations with the youth with our civil society organizations, and we think that maybe with the capacity building uh, and awareness uh, later on, uh, because now we have already the, in place the uh, updated NDC, we think that uh, the youth actually could use the NDC as one of the mobilization tools for resources. Uh, and so that is actually what we've been encouraging them to do, to focus on what is in the NDC, what will be in the NAPS, and use that as a mobilization, uh, resource mobilization tool for them. Because many of, we have a number of youth organizations, uh, groups 
And so if they just use this to be um, a, a tool for them to mobilize resources, we believe that it can actually work out. But of course, in government as well, uh, at times we have some small grants uh, from different projects or programs. And so these groups actually are encouraged um, to apply and uh, try to, to get the funding through those uh, channels. And, um, okay, thank you. Thank you. We need to, we need to yeah. conclude the, the session so now. So can I stop there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I you can finish. I had two more so questions, but we can have bilateral. Exactly. I can really respond to some of your questions later. Okay. So just uh, maybe your, your take-home message, and I'm sorry the, the time is up now, but we had a very interesting interventions as well. Yes, uh, I'm not uh, responding to a specific question, but uh, to appreciate the contributions. Uh, and also just emphasize that for me it's very critical that uh, we create the space because uh, how we use the space, the finances, we will deal with it. But the space has to be there for uh, different uh, groups to be able to participate. And of course also appreciate that now the Coronivia talks about inclusiveness and participation. So now we have to see how do we implement that space that has been provided. Yeah. Thank you for bringing back Coronivia to the room. <laughs> Yes, uh, in 2002, I was the youth caucus rep representative at the agricultural discussion. And after I made my statement, some two guys from Kenya and Zimbabwe, they came to me, they fired me properly. Later on, I understood they were working for Monsanto. And it took me two years to be able to raise my hand again. From that day, I decided to spend my time building capacity for young people so that they become real agents of change. I'm talking about 2002 in Johannesburg. So. How do we transform young people into agents of change today? For me, it is the challenge. They need to have the information. They need to be given the space and also a voice. And use, we organized a caravan in 30 countries. Young people were those at the front line of those caravans. Yes, it's possible to have young people as solution providers to the climate crisis. That's for me is my takeaway. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Very clear mission here. Um, okay, so now I'd like to invite uh, Joao Campari. He's the global lead, uh, leader of the uh, WWF Food Practice. Um, we're really curious to know how you, you, what you heard and learned from the session and how you would see the way forward. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yeah? I'll try. I'll try. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, I, I can hold it up. Uh, I'd like to start this um, brief uh, intervention just by asking you to be silent for a minute and listen. Listen around. There is cacophony in the room, right? We cannot change the world if we are talking at the same time everywhere because there is a world out there asking for action not more talks this is why it's so inspiring to have the experiences that you brought to the table the solutions that you're bringing and the efforts that all of you are bringing here is our hope to decarbonize the economy right so talking at the same time everybody won't do the trick we need to roll up our sleeves and face the world out there. The second um, um, uh, point that I'd like to make is that to decarbonize the economy, we cannot, and we talk, when we talk about food systems, uh, we cannot act on production alone, right? Even radically different uh, modes of farming will drive rising demand for land and other resources. If they are not accompanied by more sustainable food consumption and significant reductions on food loss and waste, there is no decarbonization of the economy. It's only through a full food system approach that we can become a major part of the solution to climate change instead of the food system continuing to be the problem, right? This is why it's so important for Coronivia to promote a holistic approach to addressing issues related to agriculture and food security. It needs to cover both adaptation and mitigation and broaden the scope to take a whole of food systems perspective, not only agriculture, as much as that is important, we all know that. 
there are three key things that uh, I would like to share with you that I find it important when it comes to NDCs for food. The first one is that countries are increasingly thinking about food in their NDCs, but they still do in a rather siloed uh, way. Uh, it's encouraging to see, as Patty was mentioned in the beginning, that the number of NDCs included, including some mention of food in their documents, rose from 107 countries to 125 countries in the last assessment, since the last assessment. However, only a few countries um, include multiple aspects of the food systems that support a systemic approach. Science is clear that we can only stay within the 1.5 degrees limit. Again, the 1.5 degree is not a target, it's a limit, okay? So we need to be very careful how we interpret this. Um, uh, and by acting on food production, consumption, loss, and waste. While the potential impact of action in production, loss, and waste or diets will differ from country to country, the majority of the NDCs should include concrete steps to implement solutions across the multiple aspects of food systems. However, the emphasis still remains on agriculture, with critical solutions continuing to be uh, overlooked on the consumption space and on the food loss and waste space. The second key message that I'd like to leave uh, with you, there are only three of them, so bear with me. Uh, shifting to healthier and more sustainable diets and dramatically slashing food loss and waste are not optional, okay? If we want to stay within the 1.5 degrees. When we look at the countries that have included these solutions into, our, uh, into their NDCs, as few as 36 countries include actions on food loss and waste only. And only five countries included diets as a means to stay uh, on the course of the 1.5 degrees. So this largely ignores the collective opportunity to, to reduce global emissions by an extra 2.5 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, which is equivalent um, uh, of taking more than half a billion cars off the road every year, just to put in orders of magnitude. Also, although 550 million people depend on fisheries uh, and aquacultures for nutrition and income, only fo uh, 54 countries consider sustainable fisheries and aquaculture in their NDCs. The third message that I'd like to give you, and this is the last one, countries aren't placing enough emphasis on the communities who are often respons responsible for implementing solutions. Less than half of all updated NDCs mentions uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. I was shocked to hear that. It's still fewer mentioned the importance of smallholder farmers. Oftentimes, these are the communities that are directly responsible for implementing solutions as we heard here from this panel today. Recognizing and supporting indigenous peoples and local communities' rights could result in more than 1.5 uh, gigaton of CO2 equivalent of emissions being avoided each year, or over 300,000 cars off the road, again, just to, to, to keep a comparison. So recognizing and support the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities is particularly important everywhere, but especially so in Af here in Africa. Um, but it's not just a responsibility of Af African countries, and we need to take that into consideration and highlight that. Non-African member states and businesses must also invest in systems approaches in the regions and supporting the rights of food producers and uh, communities that live uh, in, in fragile contexts. Implementation uh, will require collaboration across actors, right? So multi-stakeholder mechanisms, as we saw with the UN Food System Summit last year, are very important and can highly, uh, can highly be effective if done right. There is shared energy across food systems, as many organizations who share similar levels of ambitions as us, we, can, we, we need to rely on these multi-stakeholder mechanisms. In summary, NDC targets must be more ambitious and words must be followed by actions. We need to stop this cacophony. We need to work together to carbonize this, decarbonize this economy. And again, 
respect the limits of our planet. Remember, 1.5 degrees is a limit. It's not a target that we have to achieve. Thank you very much for having me in this panel. Thank you very much for what you do.